let us let us look at classical criticism. And by classical criticism, we are referring to mimetic criticism. Mimetic criticism is a type of criticism in which the critic determines how close the literary work is in imitating reality. The critic attempts to determine how the literary work is, how close the literary work is in imitating reality. So mimetic criticism is about the determination of the closeness of literature to the world from which the literature emanates. To the world from which the literature emanates. This is based on the idea that literature takes its structure from the external world. This is based on the idea that literature derives its structure from the external world. So the word mimetic is taken from the word mimesis. And in Mimesis, we are looking at the semblance between the artwork and the world in which the artwork comes from. The semblance between the artwork and the world from which the artwork is taken from. Mimetic criticism or classical criticism goes as far back as the classical period with Plato and with Plato and Aristotle. Mimetic criticism, mimetic criticism goes as far back as the classical period. It is still in practice today, though we will not take any critics seriously if he were to make mimesis the whole concern of his critical gesture. So more or less for today, in today's world, Nemesis is a kind of occasional, accidental, incidental criticism. It comes up in a larger critical enterprise. It comes up occasionally in a a more rigorous enterprise, critical enterprise. It is incidental. So it is still relevant today, 
and it was relevant for many centuries. Um, proposed by different critics with different ideas of how literature should relate or how literature should be related to society and societal events. So let us begin with Plato. Plato did not believe in literature. Plato did not believe in literature because he thought that literature was two steps removed from reality. He thought that literature was two steps removed from reality. He thought that literature was two steps removed from reality. According to Plato, reality did not reside in the material world. Reality resided in a spiritual world or what he called the world of forms. And so the physical world was an imitation of the world of forms. The spiritual world which the eyes could not see. But then the artist imitated the physical world, which is not original. But then the artist imitated the physical world, which is not the original world. Thus making his art to be two steps removed from reality. Reality meaning truth. Reality meaning truth. So according to Plato, literature could not be used to teach truth, which was much needed in society. Literature could not be used to teach truth, which was much needed in society. So, Plato saw literature as fiction. Plato saw literature as what? Fiction. A lie. Falsehood. Plato saw literature as fiction, a lie, a falsehood. And because of this, literature did not have a place in the ideal society in the in the Kali Palace because Plato said that liter literary practitioners that spreads writers should be banned from the Kali Palace. Literature should be banned, censored in the Kali Palace, in the ideal city. He later said that only poets who were morally upright and whose work advocated moral uprightness should be allowed in the republic. But then the epic of the time 
the epic of the time was full of what to Plato were undesirable elements like the God's line taking sides not being objective and so on and so forth Then came Aristotle. Then came Aristotle. Who was Plato's student? Then came Aristotle, who was Plato's student? Aristotle argued with his teacher on the relevance of literature in human society. It is agreed with Plato especially on the banning of literature from the society for propagating falsehood. Aristotle said that the world of forms could not be seen. The world of forms could not be known. That instead, Instead, the physical world that we know should be taken as the original world. And that the artist then will not be two steps removed from reality for imitating the original world, the physical world, but will only be one step removed from reality. Instead of looking at literature as a fiction, Aristotle saw literature as the art of imitation. That is the art of imitating reality. And the primary purpose for imitating reality is to bring about entertainment because human beings love imitation they love drama they love seeing themselves again on stage love seeing human realities depicted on the stage So it is to Aristotle that we owe the existence of literature in human society today. It is to Aristotle that we owe the existence of literature in human society today. And to today, literature is still seen as an art of imitation because it tells the human story. It imitates the human experience. It, it, it depicts, portrays the human experience across time and time. Let us look at Horace. H O R S E, Horace. 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 Horace's full name is 
Quintus, Horatius, Flaccus. Quintus, Horatius, Flaccus. Quintus is spelled Q U I N T U S. Horatius is spelled H O R A T I U S. Flaccus is spelled F L A W C U S. Horace lived between 65 to 8 BC. Horace lived, Horace lived between 65 to 8 BC. 8 BC. He was a Roman poet and satirist. That's where you have the Horatian satire. It's from him that you have the Horatian satire which is mild on the victim. He was a Roman poet and satirist, and it is from him that we have the Horatian satire, which is usually mild and what? Gentle on the victim. The, the ideas of our race, that is of our race concerning criticism, Horace's ideas on criticism are contained in a work entitled As Poetica, The Art of Poetry. The Art of Poetry. As Poetica, The Art of Poetry. If you cannot catch the Latin, you catch the English. As Poetica, The Art of Poetry. As Poetica, as is spelled A R S, Poetica, P O E T I C A, the art of poetry. According to Horace, poets must imitate other poets. Poets, poets must imitate other poets. And he recommends that Greek poets should be imitated. He recommends that Greek poets should be imitated. That Greek poets should be imitated. Of course, he was a Roman poet, and the Greeks preceded the Romans. So he said Greek poets should be imitated. Horace recommends that critics must first of all learn the standards of literature. Critics must first of all learn the standards of literature. Critics must first of all do what? Learn the standards of literature. Because, of course, it is these standards that he will use to judge literature, whether it is great or otherwise. And then Horace went on to give the do's and don'ts for writers. He goes on to give the do's and don'ts for writers. And one of them is that writers should write about traditional subjects in unique ways. Writers should write about traditional subjects in unique ways. Meaning that writers should innovate. Writers should be creative. Writers should be innovative. Writers should be imaginative in their writing. Writers must evolve in that style. They must write ordinary things in extraordinary ways.
Horace was an advocate of moderation. Horace was an advocate of moderation. Horace was an advocate of moderation. He charged writers to avoid extremities. Going to the extreme. He was an advocate of moderation. The middle states. Not doing too much. Not by reaching yourself. So writers were to avoid the extreme in the choice of words. Writers were to avoid the extreme in what? In the choice of word. And what do we call choice of word? Diction. Diction. Good. In subject matter. In subject matter. Writers should avoid extremity in the choice of subject matter. And in style. So he was more or less an advocate of decorum. He was more or less an advocate of decorum. He was more or less an advocate of what? Decorum. Horace said that literature should be sweet and useful. Using the term dulce et util. Sweet and useful. Literature should be sweet and useful. Dulce et util. D U L C E. Space E T then U T I L E to be Latin for sweet and useful, meaning that literature should teach and delight at the same time. Literature should teach and delight at the same time. Good literature teaches and delights at the same time. That means that you do not only enjoy a good work of literature because it's entertaining, you also learn in the process of entertainment. So literature should teach and delight at the same time. Then we move from Horace, we want to look at Longinus. Move from Horace, we want to look at Longinus. Longinus is spelled L. O N G I N U S. Longinus. Longinus lived in the first century AD. Longinus lived in the first century AD. Longinus lived in the first century AD. So, his ideas concerning literary criticism are contained in a work entitled On the Sublime. On the Sublime. S U B L I M E. On the Sublime. On the Sublime. His ideas on literary criticism are contained in the work on the sublime where sublime is spelled s u b l i m e longinus is said to be the first comparative critic longinus is said to be the first comparative critic because of the combining of hebrew Greek and Latin quotations in his work 
because he combined Greek, Hebrew, and Latin quotations in his work. So he is seen to be the first comparative critic. You understand that comparative criticism draws from different traditions and from different regions. Comparative criticism studies at once the literature of different traditions, different cultures, and different regions and languages in a bit to draw parallel in the hermeneutics. So, he says that writer should, uh, literature should concentrate on a single element of a text. The critic should concentrate on a single element of the text. Maybe the theme, maybe the subject matter, and so on and so forth. The critic should be well read. The critic should be well read. Longinus advocated that the critic should be well read. Critic should be well read. Should read very well. The education, the education of the critic is very important. The education of the critic is very important for Longinus. The critic should read widely. The reason the critic should read widely is that so that you have a large knowledge reservoir to determine which literature is great and which one is mediocre. You should have a reservoir of knowledge to determine which literature is great and which one is mediocre. And how do we know good literature? How do we know good, good literature? Great literature achieves the sublime. Great literature is that which achieves the sublime. Great literature is that which achieves the sublime. That means it has the ability to delight the reader. It has the ability to teach and delight the reader. It has its own internal pleasure. When you read it, you enjoy. When you read it, you enjoy. That's great literature. Great literature is timeless and universal. Great literature takes the reader to the heights of pleasure. The sublime. What makes a literature great? According to, according to Longino, Longinus is the sublime, and the sublime implies timelessness and universality of literature. The sublime implies timelessness and the universality of literature. The sublime implies that the literature is timeless and universal. We now want to look at the ideas of Dante Alighieri concerning literary criticism next time. Dante Alighieri. Dante is spelled D-A-N-T-E. 
Alijar spell A L I G H R E R I. I'll take that again. A L I G H I E R I. Dante Alighieri. Alighieri. A L I G H I E R I. Dante Alighieri lived between 1265 to 1321 AD, meaning that he lived in the medieval period. He was a medieval critic. He represents medieval criticism. His work represents Literary criticism in the medieval period. The medieval period. His work represents literary criticism in the medieval period. He lived in. He lived between twelve sixty five to thirteen twenty one A.D meaning that he was a medieval critic. He was born in Florence, Italy. He was born in the city of Florence, Italy, in the Middle Ages. At a point, he was banished from Florence for political reasons. Critics always get into trouble. Critics always get into trouble. At the point he was banished from Florence for political reasons. He wrote most of his works while in exile. He wrote most of his work while in exile. He is the author of Divine Comedy. He is the author of Divine Comedy. He is the author of Divine Comedy. Dante Alighieri's ideas concerning literary criticism are contained Dante Alighieri's ideas concerning literary criticism are contained in a document entitled Letter to Can Grande de la Scala. Letter to Can Grande de la Scala. In this work, Dante advocates the use of the vulgar tongue. He advocates the use of the vulgar tongue. If you don't call it the vulgar tongue, you call it the vernacular. The vernacular. Dante, Dante Advocates the use of the vulgar tongue, V U L G A R, the vulgar tongue, as the language of literature. The language of literature. At the time when the predominant literary language was Latin or Greek. If I don't like the language was Latin or Greek. By the vulgar tongue, by vernacular, it means the language of ordinary people. Everyday language of everyday people to be used for literature.
she says this language as beautiful and appropriate for any creative enterprise. Dante also brought symbolic meanings into literature. Dante also brought symbolic meanings into literature. For the first time, literature could be interpreted as having layers of meaning. Literature could be interpreted as having layers of meaning. Not only this, for the first time, literature could be interpreted based on allegorical meaning. It could be interpreted based on allegorical meaning. Allegorical, from allegory. Before now, or until now, it was only the Bible that could be interpreted using allegorical meaning meaning this there should be the surface meaning and there should be the deep meaning but with Dante allegory this was extended to the study of literature which could be studied as having layers of meaning including symbolic meaning so you must understand that it was Dante who introduced allegorical meaning to the interpretation, to the study of literature. So whenever we mention Dante Alighieri in literary criticism, you must know his contribution. And what is his, his contribution? Symbolic interpretation of literature, allegorical interpretation of literature which before now or until now was the the exclusive preserve of the bible now let us move on to sir philip sydney we are moving near our home that's for those who Home English is the home. Or home England is the home. So we are moving nearer home with Philip Sidney in the Renaissance. Because you know, after the middle period is the Renaissance. So Philip Sidney lived between 1554 and 1586. So you need to understand that these men. These people represented the, the critical ideas of that time. That's why, in fact, they represented the age. I was so lucky that they represented the age. So to talk about them was to talk about the age in which they lived. So Sir Philip Sidney represented the critical spirits of the English literature in the Renaissance period and he lived between 1554 and what? 1586 and he lived between 1554 and 1586 his ideas on literary criticism are contained in the work An Apology for poetry. His ideas on literary criticism are contained in the work An Apology for Poetry. An Apology for Poetry. Or you can call it In Defense of Poetry. You don't call it An Apology for Poetry. You call it what? In defense of poetry. 
and it was written in 1595 it was published in 1595 the work was published posthumously the work was published posthumously so the work was published after he died that's a posthumous publication that's why he lived to 1586 and the work was published in 1595 this work inaugurates the english literary tradition this work inaugurates the english literary tradition or inaugurates the English literary criticism. In keeping with the principles or the spirit of the Renaissance, in keeping with the principles or the spirit of the Renaissance, Sydney's An Apology for Poetry draws from classical writers. Draws from classical writers like Plato, Aristotle, and Horace. Because the Renaissance writers valued the ancient. Renaissance writers valued classical writers. In the work, Sydney places poetry above the other genres of literature. Sydney places poetry above the other genres of literature. Places poetry above the other genres of literature. He advocates the three unities of action, time, and place. He is so passionate about poetry or literature that he places a curse on anyone who does not love poetry. Sydney plays a curse on anyone who does not love poetry. Let's talk about John Dryden. Let's talk about John Dryden. John Dryden lived between 1631 and 1700. John Dryden lived between 1631 and 1700. John Dryden embodies the spirit and the ideals of the neoclassical period. John Dryden embodies the spirit and the ideals of the neoclassical period. Most of the ideas of Dryden concerning literary criticism of his time or concerning the literature of his time are contained in a text entitled 
an essay of dramatic poesy. An essay of dramatic poesy. Published in 1668. Published in 1668. An essay of dramatic poesy. Published in 1668. 1668 1668 in the in the work there's a debate as to whether to imitate nature or great writers of the classical period as to whether to imitate nature or the great writers of the classical period. Whether to imitate nature or the great writers of the classical period. As far as the neoclassical critics were concerned, the ideal source of imitation should be the classical writers. Their maxim was imitate the ancient and you imitate the best. Imitate the ancient and you imitate the best. That was their maxim. Imitate the ancient and you imitate the best. So most certainly the uh, the resolution should be like that writers should imitate the best writers of the classical period in keeping with the tenets of the neoclassical literature. Garden also emphasizes the unity of time, place, and action. He says that the language of poetry should be based on proper speech. That means it should be refined. Language of poetry should be based on proper speech. That means the language of poetry should be what? Refined. Be refined. It should be elevated. The language of literature should be marked by decorum. Marked by decorum. He prefers English drama to French drama. Because English drama has diversity. Because English drama has diversity. English drama has the best stage. And he liked the Shakespearean tradition. Garden goes on to say that clarity, order, decorum, elegance, cleverness, and wit should define literary works. Clarity, order, decorum, elegance, Cleverness and wit, W-I-T, should define works of literature. We move on to Alexander Pope. 
Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope lived between 1688 and 1744. Alexander Pope lived between 1688 and 1744. He was a neoclassical writer. He was a neoclassical writer. And his ideas on literature are contained in Essay on Criticism. Essay on Criticism. His ideas on literature are contained in Essay on Criticism. It was written in 1711. Alexander Pope is of the opinion or the view that poets should imitate classical writers. Poets should imitate classical writers. Critics should also derive the standards of judgment from classical critics. For the 18th century critics, these standards of judgment should include poetic diction, the use of heroic, the use of heroic couplets, personification of abstraction, and refined emotions or restraint. Standards of judgment for the 18th century critics should be based on poetic diction, <coughs> the use of heroic couplets, personification of abstraction. So if you read most neoclassical works, you come across these stylistic features and refined emotion or restraint. Let us move on and look at William Westworth. Let us talk about William Westworth. We are now in the Romantic period. We are now in the Romantic period. We want to talk about William Westworth, who lived between 1770 in 1850. He lived between 1770 and 1850. So William Westworth is a representative figure of the Romantic period. It's a representative figure of the Romantic period. His ideas on literary criticism are contained in a text entitled The Preface to the Lyrical Ballads. Preface to Lyrical Ballads, published in 1798. <laughs> Yeah. 
So what he advocates is a radical shift in the subject matter of poetry where he advocates is a radical shift in the subject matter of poetry and the language of poetry. That is, the subject matter of poetry or literature should be about common people, not about kings. The subject matter of literature should now be about common people and not about important people in society. The subject matter of poetry should be about common people, not about kings as it used to be before then. The language of poetry should be the common tongue. Language of poetry should be the common tongue. That is language as used by the common people. Language as really used by the common people. They call it rustic language. Language of poetry should be rustic language. And literature should be about the promotion of emotion. Poetry should be about the promotion of emotions. Poetry should be about the promotion of emotions. Poetry should emphasize imagination rather than logic. Poetry should emphasize imagination rather than logic. Poetry should emphasize imagination rather than logic. All these are part of the tenets of romanticism. All these are part of the tenets of romanticism. So literature should be expressive. That means it should be about the author expressing his or emotion. So that is the reason in romantic literature Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions recollected in tranquility. So we move on to Hippolytus. Hippolytus. H I W P O L Y T E. Ten. T A I N E. T A I N E. Hippolytus. He lived between 1828 and 1893. Platon lived between 1828 and 1893. By this time, we are talking about the Victorian period. Because the Victorian period began around 1835. Polite was a French historian and literary critic. Polite was a French historian and literary and a literary critic. He 
his work brought about what is known as historical and scientific determinism. It's what brought about what is known as historical and scientific determinism. His criticism captures the essence of the Victorian period, especially concerning literary criticism. Okay, concerning literary criticism. All right, let us continue. So, Tan's ideas on literature are contained in the history of English literature. The history of English literature. In the work, Tan established the historical approach to literary interpretation. The historical approach to literary interpretation. One of the tenets of this approach states that one of the tenets of this approach states that text should be studied alongside its author and milieu. Text should be studied alongside its author and milieu for a comprehensive and a more rewarding literary interpretation. That should be studied alongside its author and milieu for a more rewarding literary interpretation. What this means is that the work of art is studied alongside the history of its time. The work of art is studied alongside the history of its time. The work of art should be studied alongside the history of its time. Ten devised four categories 
under which a work of art could be studied for a more robust understanding. Ten. devised four categories in which a work of art could be studied for a more rewarding understanding. These are race. These categories are race, milieu, moment, and dominant faculty and dominant faculty race r s c e milieu m i l i e u moment m o m e n t n t and dominant faculty According to 10, it is when all these four are put together that we will have a better understanding of what the work of art means. When all of these are put together, we will have a good understanding of what the work of art means. So race means the beliefs of the people of a time, the emotions of the people at a time, the feelings of the people of a time in the work of art. Milieu talks about the surrounding, the place where the work of art is set, the setting of the work of art. Moment means the time that the work of art is written. And dominant faculty refers to the individual talent of the writer that marks him out from the others. Individual talent of the writer. So race plus milieu plus moment plus dominant faculty is equal to the work of art. The race plus moment plus milieu plus moment plus dominant faculty is equal to the work of art. Race plus milieu plus moment plus dominant faculty is equal to the work of art. 10 is of the belief that we should study the work of art to know the man. Study the work to know the man. Study the work to know the man. Then we have Then we have Matthew Arnold Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold is another Victorian critic of literature. Matthew Arnold is another Victorian critic of literature. He lived between 1822 to 1888. He lived between 1822 to 1888. Anna believes that poetry can provide the much needed truths values and guidance for society 
at the time when the society was destabilized by scientific discoveries. I now believe that poetry can provide the much needed truths, values, and guidance for society at a time when at a time when literature was uh, when society was destabilized by scientific discoveries and all elevates poetry above religion, science, and philosophy. And all elevates poetry above religion, above science, and philosophy. It should be noted that Anno has two essays that contain his ideas on literary criticism. Anno has two essays that contain his ideas on literary criticism. These are the study of poetry and the function of criticism at the present time. These essays are the study of poetry and the function of criticism at the present time. Critics should be critics should be objective. According to Arno, this is because he sees criticism as a disinterested endeavor. Critics should be objective, according to Arno, because he sees criticism as a disinterested endeavor. He sees criticism as a disinterested endeavor. So critics should be objective and they should use the objective criteria to determine the higher truth or seriousness of a work of art based on classical critical values. Arnold advocated or Arnold advocates the application of classical rules to the study of poetry. Anal advocates the application of classical rules to the study of poetry. Okay, please let us take a break. Um, at this point, we will continue after some time. <laughs> 